Nobody talks about the weather hoping to hear something new. In fact, in an essay published 264 years ago yesterday, Samuel Johnson made this same point. When two Englishmen meet, their first talk is of the weather, and they are in haste to tell each other what each must already know. Instead, he explains, we do this to make a connection. This is why we rejoice mutually at good weather as an escape from something we feared, and we complain about bad weather as the loss of something we hoped. Now, I love this deep reason for our small talk, but I also hear in these words a warning. If it's this connection that we want, it's time to change the way we talk about the weather. Right now, we think of the weather as a specific set of conditions that can be measured, rain, heat, humidity. We might not always use numbers when we're chatting with our neighbors, but we refer to conditions that could be expressed with a number, and we know how to read a report like this one. Over the last 20 years, though, researchers have identified two increasingly urgent problems with this approach to the weather. First, it's too narrow. Focusing only on conditions that can be measured has made it hard for us to understand how changes in these aspects of the weather might be connected to other political or economic conditions, both in the past and present. In the context of the current climate crisis, this weakness is also making it more difficult for us to assess the full scope of future risk. At the same time, the social meaning of the weather has changed. Today, if we hear a report about an unseasonably hot week in October, some people will interpret that as good news, but others will hear it with a deep sense of unease. We even have a name for this unease, climate anxiety, or fear focused on climate change that is characterized by a feeling of helplessness and often triggered by reports of extreme weather. Now, this condition is complex, as is the science that explains the relationship of individual weather events to climate. But one consequence of the rise of this type of anxiety is that for a lot of people, talking about the weather doesn't feel safe or easy anymore. We've been here before, though, and understanding this history can help us find a way forward. 300 years ago, not everyone agreed that the weather was something that happened every day. The most popular branch of meteorology was focused, as the name suggests, on the study of meteors and eclipses, and it was quite separate from the informal study of animal behaviors and other signs that seem to predict day-to-day -day change. In the 17th century, though, the barometer and thermometer were invented, making it possible to see tiny changes in the air that were happening all the time. And as these tools became more popular, people responded with a lot of the same concerns we're struggling with today. For some people, it felt empowering to be able to see in a tube that a storm was coming. But for others, the view of the weather these instruments captured was too narrow, and the way they explained the world made many people feel small, like they'd lost some sense of power to make change in their own lives. If we can see ourselves in these debates, though, we can also see the present as a chance to do things differently. If the concept of the weather changed once, we could change it again. And if we find it difficult to imagine now what else the weather could be, I think these 18th century fights about the risks and rewards of a thermometer's view of the weather could give us some useful alternatives to explore. So let me show you what I mean. This is an 18th century weather diary. It was written by Reverend Henry White, a schoolmaster in Essex, a small town. So typically, this kind of weather record is used to create a historical weather model, which we then use to, predict, to help predict the weather of the future. As an English professor, though, what interests me about this record is not the data it contains, but the way it's laid out on the page and what those choices tell us about what it meant to watch the weather in the past. So, Consider, for instance, the questions expressed by this line. Below it, we find a weather record that looks pretty familiar. 
We have the readings of the barometer, the thermometer, and wind direction, all expressed in numbers or shorthand. Above this line, though, we find a detailed written description of the weather each day, beginning with the sky in the morning and ending with the sky at night, and including in between all kinds of other information about life around the house, mostly of the type that it's easy to observe but hard to measure. So here, for instance, Reverend White has jumbled together observations about the frost and sunshine with observations about the fact that the cheese was cut on February 28th, uh, and a note about how the British House of Commons has voted against the American Revolution. With this line, then, Reverend White is highlighting a difference between the kind of information he can take in with his eyes and the kind of information his new technology can capture, but he's also asking a question. If we were to replace the top half of this report, which was pretty typical for the time, with the bottom, the new meteorology, what kinds of changes would those numbers leave out? As it turns out, Reverend White wasn't alone in this concern. As I continued to investigate other 18th century weather diaries, I found a lot of people really curious about their new thermometers and barometers, but really not sure how to use them. So I found all of these stories of people taking their instruments upstairs and downstairs to see if the readings would be different on different floors. And a lot of people were really surprised to discover that their readings would be different at different times of day. Now, there's a good technological explanation for some of those responses. In the 18th century, those instruments were still relatively new. So it just took some time for people to figure out what the movement of the mercury in these tubes revealed about the condition of the air and what that information meant. If it was true, as these instruments suggested, that something was happening in the air all the time to move this liquid up and down, did that mean that the same forces were at work on the liquid in our bodies? At the time, many people found that suggestion unsettling. And so they reacted, like Reverend White, by emphasizing everything the instruments couldn't see. So, Sometimes, this anxiety looks like this. So here, this man has been distracted by his new technology, the thermometer, and he's missed the information that really matters, the ice on the ground, so he slips. Other times, though, the worries are more complex. So here, a comedian named Thomas Gordon is dismayed to discover that the weather is acting on him all the time. If it's possible, he asks, that our thoughts and actions are as dependent on the weather as the mercury in the thermometer, isn't it grating to hear that the last $2,000 you gave to a church or hospital didn't follow from your habitual goodness, but rather was the effect of a brisk morning walk? His language here is a bit unfamiliar, but these worries show us something important about how the way we think about the weather shapes the way we think about ourselves. For some people, this new technology really was empowering because it gave us the ability to predict and navigate previously mysterious situations. For others, though, like Gordon, this technology felt disempowering because it offered an automatic explanation for what used to be considered a moral choice. And of course, both interpretations are true. Data does help to explain the world, and yet, as Gordon anticipated, this emphasis on the explanatory power of data has made it more difficult to study how our experiences are shaped by all of those influences that we cannot measure. For a long time, the benefits of this data-focused view of the weather have outweighed this cost. But in the context of the present climate crisis, this emphasis on what we can measure but not control has become a bigger obstacle to our understanding how we got here. And it's not just that our view of the weather is too narrow. It still has this feeling of helplessness built right in. Day over day, we check the weather mostly so that we know what to do or to wear to protect ourselves from it. And the effect of this gesture, as Gordon observed, is to forget the influence of our own actions and the influence of our own values on the world that we enter. Now, it's difficult to measure the effect of a habit of thought, but I think we can catch a glimpse of these effects in new studies on climate anxiety. When interviewed, 
those experiencing climate anxiety consistently identify helplessness or the sense that nothing can be done as a central dimension of their suffering, and reports of extreme weather are a common trigger for that anxiety. Now, those concerns are real, and they are driven by much more than a narrow view of the weather. But if we hear in those studies even an echo of Gordon's concern, I think that echo can also be a reminder. In the 18th century, these writers were responding to a change in what the weather was. And so if the model of the weather that we've inherited from that moment no longer works for us, we can change it again. So what might it look like to expand our understanding of the weather? In my own life, I've found an opportunity to practice this in my morning routine. Because every day, as, I'm, as we're putting on our shoes, I ask my two-year-old what he thinks the weather will be like. He very often says that he thinks the weather will be two, because this is the first number he's learned. <laughs> but as I realized that I'd accidentally modeled that for him, I started experimenting with ways to expand that answer. We could look out the window, for instance, and notice the paths that our neighbors have shoveled in the sidewalk, or decorations going up, or a fence recently repaired. So far, this effort has shown us two things. First, there is evidence everywhere that our environments are made by forces we cannot measure. Forces like generosity, or delight in those decorations, or pride in that fence. Second, those forces are always there. Like the wind, the values that shape our environments might change direction, but their presence is a constant. So if we could learn to see them the way these 18th century writers learned to see the temperature, we could uncover a whole new reason to celebrate good weather. For some people, of course, I know that good weather will always feel first like an escape from something we fear. But when I look ahead for my son, what I hope that he knows is that good weather is just an idea and we're making it together every day. <laughs>